So the last five techniques, I think I wanted to start with this one primarily because it's first, but also I spent the most time here because I think a lot of us, if we're if you're experimenting with LLMs, you are often running into RAG as a technique. And for anyone that doesn't know, it's a technique that enhances large language models by combining them with an external knowledge base and then retrieves relevant information and Im embeds it in the, con in the context of the prompt given to a language model, which allows it to produce more informed and accurate responses because as Lee, who was mentioning, uh, LLMs have known problems with memorization and also uh, hallucinations. Li Hu categorized these into three different, or the authors categorize the different RAG techniques into three different areas, textual documents. And these are retrievers that typically don't generalize well, I'd say, because they require specific vocab needing to be present. But so I think some of us are familiar with things like term term frequency inverse document frequency or em25 best match 25 which is a ranking algorithm to determine relevance of a document to a query and so you can see a nice graphic of what sparse retrievers are versus dense and using something like bert as the encoder for queries and documents and doing some similarity matching is the dense retriever technique at a very high level so let me just quickly move along and feel free to interrupt again. So I, I didn't read all the papers, <laughs> but I wanted to pull in some like high level graphics because they show you other implementations of RAG using different LLMs. And in this case, some of them are using smaller fine tune LLMs as part of the retriever process, retrieval process, I say, and knowledge GPT at the top was one of the highlighted applications. And so it uses something like and all these papers have their own branded prompting technique. So this one is called program of thought prompting technique. And so it generates search queries for knowledge bases. And then it has two tasks associated with it. It's the knowledge retrieval part and the knowledge storage. And since we're talking about SMs, oh yeah, and I guess I should back up. The small models in this case are the retrievers for rank systems. And so retrieval and for knowledge GPT involves three steps. It generates a piece of search code, which you can see in the yellow. And then the search code is executed to retrieve the relevant knowledge. And then the generated code, so it uses all of these things and then is fed into the actual LLM to answer the input query. And then just quickly moving around to TRAG. So it basically is a vector database plus an entities tree. For a given input user query, the vector database is search searches across the vector document, vector database. Um, it pulls in the relevant chunk. If there's any organization mention, it then queries uh, across the entities tree to add that information to the context. Um, and then it uses a fine-tuned LLM um, to generate a response. Um, and then, so that's some information. Oh yeah, and so these are using structured knowledge, meaning from knowledge graphs, from tables, or from databases. All right, well, we are so gone on time. So I'm just gonna move ahead if anyone has any flags. I'll like, I'll, again, I'll share this in the Slack if anyone's interested. And then the other piece that's probably relevant to all of us, especially if you're using the API primarily, is using small models in prompt-based learning. So prompt engineering generally, as we know, is constructing prompts to guide frozen LLMs without parameter updates and in-context learning is including a few examples within the prompt. So we could potentially use small models here to augment the prompt retrieval process or the prompt selection. And so I just wanted to show two examples that were given in the paper. The, the first one, Uprise, it, it tunes a lightweight and retriever that automatically retrieves prompts from a pre-constructed pool. So it adds a prompt to a given input. Yeah, it prepends. And then it uses the frozen LLM to evaluate the prompt performance. And in order to train the prompt retriever, the obtained evaluation from the frozen LLM is then used to tune the retriever in a reverse manner. And then there's the slam, <laughs> which is a generator retriever to which decomposes, which is used to decompose a complex prompt into subproblems that require fewer reasoning steps. And then the large model comes in to answer 
this expanded input and it's called the solver large language model. So yeah, there's, you're just moving ahead. You can use uh, models to fix flaws of large language models. This kind of starts going into contrast of decoding that Valdemar started talking about. And one of the papers had a very spicy example that I wanted to talk about, but I'll just share it in the Slack. And then, so you can use de contrast of decoding, which is leveraging the differences between two models, a larger capable model, the expert, and a smaller, less capable model, the amateur. And the idea is to choose tokens that maximize the difference in log likelihood between the expert and amateur. We're selecting tokens that the expert model finds highly probable. And okay, so I guess a useful point here is that contrast of decoding happens during inference. It's not doing any sort of training of or knowledge transfer. It's just using combined outputs to produce the best next term or highest li log likelihood term. And so where that's different is, oh yeah, I think we're at time. So maybe I'll pause here and just see what everyone's. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think one, you can just go ahead for a few more minutes. Yeah. You, you guys can just stick around. If you guys have no shop exit at right now, you guys feel free to stick around. So be just take your time. Yeah. I'll probably, I actually have to run too, but I can, I'll leave in about a few minutes, but yeah, contrast of decoding happens during inference, whereas knowledge distillation is a training technique where you're training the model, larger models, like parameters and transferring them to the smaller model. And so classically, this is how distilled BERT was created. And so there's a nice graphic of distilled BERT here. Distilled BERT had full access to the internal architecture and parameters of teacher model BERT. Um, and so the main goal of this is to, yeah, model compression and improving efficiency of the larger model. And yeah, so that was the goal here for distill BERT as well. And white box knowledge distillation means that they have full access to the teacher model. And so to create distill BERT, it uses it initializes parameters from and during training and initializes parameters from the second every second later and then it employed this like triple loss function in order to generate updated internal parameters to mimic the output of BERT. So I think I've worked with BERT in the past for college projects, but I don't currently use it. Again, I'm mostly a large language model API user. And so black box is Augmenting is about is still about transferring knowledge, but it's without access to the teacher's internal architecture. So only the outputs are available. And so the student model must learn how to mimic the teacher's output given the same input. So you can do this through two techniques, or again, here's just two um, examples given. There's chain of thought where you're transferring the reasoning abilities, specifically the step-by-step -step reasoning process. And that's what's highlighted in this very tiny example here. And then the student model through training learns to produce similar reasoning chains and final answers. And then instruction following, and then is more about prompts that demonstrate how the teacher model follows instructions, which the student again learns to mimic. So the teacher prompts are typically, I was meant, I was going to try and get an image here, but teacher prompts are typically more detailed and explicit, asking for step-by-step -step process, and the student prompts are simpler. So during distillation, the student model learns to produce outputs to the teachers, even when they're given simpler prompts. And then the last, I think this is the last one, is you can use large language models to generate synthetic data for small models to train on. And so this goes back to the point about human graded data is finite that Li Hu and Valdemar also brought up. And so there's again, of course, two categories of data synthesis. So we have data generation with some examples here, as well as data augmentation where you can improve, you can possibly give more examples of the using the same base text just by asking it to generate different alternatives. Um, and I think this was flagged as one that you probably wouldn't use in a heavily regulated industry, um, like the medical field or finance, um, um, because I think for the most part, you always are trying to anticipate to get the same. Yeah. Uh, because like, I think in medical, um, environments, standard of care is very specific to a, a timeline and you don't want to 
um, alter any data that might change that information. Anyway, that's all I had. So we, wow. we got wow. through it all. Wow. Yeah, that was incredible. With slides and all. Yep. <laughs> it, 